32 pulled the slides on trombones, fingered cornets, and made faces, <laughs> but not a bar of music came forward. Oh Eight players carried the tune, and 32 carried the instruments. <laughs> I love newspapers. <laughs> I love newspapers because you can do research like this and go back and go, oh, you didn't make that up, man. You got that. Yeah. Yeah. That is great. And I've seen it happen in other bands. I've actually seen tuba players go out on a football field without mouthpieces. <laughs> and you'd see, I won't name the band, but if you ask me later, I'll tell you the band. But it's in Cincinnati. But, um, <laughs> yeah, there are like 20 sousaphones, but half of them didn't have mouthpieces. And you're like, oh all right, well, you look good, but... <laughs> so we had a lot of growing pains there. Also, we get into the, we get into the fight song. What's the fight song of St. Clair State? Bill, you ought to know it. Yeah, you should know it. A plus. <laughs> oh, oh. That is wonderful. I can't give you a grade. Uh, yeah, we had no fight song. We have no we have no fight song whatsoever. And this is a great hilarious article because at a home football game, they started singing the University of Minnesota's fight song. <laughs> because we didn't have one. Even today we we have one. That's official, and that was another part of my research was, when was the first band? Who were all the directors? Where the heck did our fight song come from? Because nobody knew. Uh, I'm a good friend with Tom, Tom Steeman in archives, and he's a great guy, but even he didn't know. This is the person who wrote The Rouser, which you just sang so beautifully. Thank you. <laughs> Very beautifully sung there. <laughs> he's, the, he's the composer. Now, um, how did I know that? Take a guess. I started tracking backwards. I started to find programs that had the last name, W-E-I-D-T, on concert programs for the Rouser. I started tracking backwards there. I also did research on him, and I found out he was a banjo player. <laughs> and he, was, he wrote mandolin music, which is really weird. But he wrote all kinds of stuff. And then I went down to the Chatfield Brass Band Library. If you've never been there, it's beautiful. Uh, the Chatfield Brass Band Library had a lot of his music. And I was going through his music down there, researching, because I'm a nerd. Don't forget, I'm a nerd. And I found this piece called Down Main Street. It's a simple march. Upper left-hand corner is the St. Cloud Rouser. Mimeograph. Do you notice? Any similarities between them? <laughs> it was one of those eureka moments where I'm in the staff and I yelled something and the librarians thought I'd fallen. And I was like, no, I finally got it. Figured out. So our fight song is actually down Main Street. <laughs> <laughs> the students, by the way, they had a couple competitions to write a fight song, and then nothing ever worked. So they sat around one day and said, hey, we've been playing this. Why don't we just use this? And after year after year, everyone forgot. And after year after year, they added words. And after year after year, they rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it. And that's what it became. So, St. Cloud State's fight song is the Rouser. It's actually down Main Street, but don't tell me. <laughs> um, Mr. White, W-E-I-D-T, had an interesting life, very interesting life. Uh, he was not a rich man at all, not a rich man at all. At one time in his census report from the 1920s, he was listed as an undertaker. <laughs> so, work was not very great. It wasn't a great work to write music, yeah. Uh, also, the Rouser was banned, uh, I'll, I'll give you this story real quick. The Rouser was banned in 1980. Why? You don't know about this? 
Okay, that's why I'm here. Good. Okay, so, in the 19, late 1980s, the band was playing at hockey games, right? All right? And they were chanting out, I'll be nice about this, all right? I'll be very, very family oriented. H U S K I E S. And the crowd, the students, not the older, more mature people, started, instead of chanting H U S K I E S, started chanting something else. <clears throat> All right? And it was blah, 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 Y-O-U. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the 80s, the solution for that, the solution was not to, you know, make the students do it correctly. The solution was to ban the fight song <laughs> from all athletic events. When I was hired in 2005, I showed up, uh, my number one job was to restart the Husky Sports Band, which did not exist. That was my number one job. And it was, uh, it was painful, and I liked it. And <laughs> when I said, hey, we're going to play, what's your fight song? Nobody knew, because they haven't been playing it. That's why if you go to a hockey game, and you hear them play, bum, ba, da, da, hey, da, 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 da. That's because they won't play the fight song. <laughs> That's why they play the hey song is because of the other. So I showed up and said, hey, where's the, where's the fight song? We don't know what it is. And I found a copy of Mimeograph, so I passed that out. We played it, and Athletics came up to me and said, hey, yeah, uh, you're not going to spell H-U-S-K-I-E-S, are you? And I said, no, no, we're not. And they said, okay, you can play it then. And third year, I decided we're going to start, we're going to start chanting H-U-S-K-I-E-S. But I had to get permission, so I went to athletics and I said, we're going to chant it, but we're going to chant H-U-S-K-I-E-S. And I said, you try and spell that out. <laughs> you try and spell the other that's inappropriate. With that rhythm. And they sat in the office and did it in front of me, and they're like, yeah, that is kind of tough. <laughs> and the first, first performance basketball game we were at, we did it. And I looked around, and everyone looked around, and the crowd was like, oh, that was really cool. <laughs> I was like, yes. And we have yet to have a single, you know, crazy student spell out the inappropriate version. And that's why we had H-U-S-K-I-E-S. And it works. It just took me a while to get there. So, uh, Maynard takes over, oh yeah, the younger brother of Lauren Maynard, and recent, oh yeah, he's another recent St. Cloud graduate. Al Harbo is after that, Harvey Schultz just for a couple years, Selkie Field is finally dedicated, Husky has become the official nickname, uh, that is G. Oliver Riggs. It's nice to know, like in 34, the Municipal Boys Band also performed at the Teachers College Auditorium, and uh, of course, Percy Riggs was directing with his father. He was an incredible man. I would have loved to have met him. 1939, the University Hymn is actually written, and it works great. The Husky Sports Band sings this at the end of every performance, and I think we're the only ones on campus who know the words, but it's a beautiful song, and it's great to sing, and I love it. Uh, big change, 1940s to 48. Ronald Riggs, oh yeah, son of G. Oliver Riggs. So he had that kind of discipline in him. He takes over in 40 to 48. Uh, he stayed on, on faculty after 48, but he changed from teaching band and a band director to guess what, what topic? Political science. <laughs> he went back to the U and got his doctorate in political science and then came back to St. Cloud State and taught political science. He got bored, I think, but he taught from 40 to 48, Glasgow took over, and then we get into 50 to 68, and uh, one of my favorite directors, Roger Barrett. Roger, has anyone here ever heard of Roger Barrett? Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 of course you have. Roger <coughs> Barrett is, he, he's the real deal. Roger Barrett is the real deal. Uh, this is just a few, 1941, this is a few things, a few, that were going on. Uh, I can come back to this later and you can read it all, but they were busy. I mean, Ron, Ronald Briggs did a great job. Now, here we go. Here's, I have two uncles that served in World War II. Now, this is 1939 to 40. Look at that. Big band. Lots of gentlemen, lots of young ladies. 
And then, <coughs> 44 to 45. And by the way, this pair of pants down here being weird, that's a woman. Yeah, there's only a couple gentlemen in that photo, because all the rest were off serving. Fascinating change. Also, 1946 that followed this, 1946 was the first year that they had a post-war marching band at Selkie Field. This is one of the only photos I could find. The women in the marching band wore skirts, <laughs> because they're going to wear skirts. However, to improve the appearance of the band, the girls will wear trousers with their uniforms next year. Uh, that was Ronald's decision, yeah. But yeah, look at those skirts. Those are, those are wow, that's incredible. Sorry for the cutoff. Uh, that is Roger Barrett, born in Missouri, got a bachelor of music. He went to Des Moines, Iowa, from State College. He was a composer as well, did a lot of compositions. Um, this is a funny <laughs> photo of Dr. Anderson, Dr. Barrett, and Dr. Riggs all playing each other's instruments. <laughs> uh, interesting guy. Roger Barrett was a chain smoker. Uh, I did more research on him, and I found his Department of Defense uh, World War II release form, the official form, you know, when you get released from the service. GD-214. And I found that he had earned a distinguished flying cross. And I said, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. No one's told me about this. Nobody. So I thought it was a mistake. No, no, no. And then I did a little bit more research. Oh, yeah, you have to shoot down five enemy planes to earn a DFC. Or you have to do something incredibly heroic. You know, like save some guy's life or cure cancer, or, you know, something like that. So I kept digging. Not a single former student knew what he did in World War II. Now, I knew he was with the 8th Air Force. So I tracked that down. Oh yeah, he was with the bomber force. So it's like basically suicide, all right? I mean, being in a bomber in World War II, you're not gonna last long. They got shot down all the time. Nobody knew. Finally tracked down his son. Took him out for coffee, and at the end of the interview I said, all right, I know your dad earned a DFC. What did he do? And the son told me, well, dad only told me once. And I'm like, that's all I need, okay? <laughs> Roger Barrett was the top turret no. gunner no. on a B-24 Liberator bomber. Now, the top turret gunner was also the navigator. Because he was a musician, the Air Force wanted him, because musicians were really good at being navigators on B-24 bombers. He was a top turret gunner and navigator on his bomber, and they had a rule back then. If you survived 25 missions, you got to go home. Because almost nobody ever did. All right, Memphis Bell was one of the first ones. His bomber survived 25 missions. His crew and his bomber survived 25 missions. They got off. They were all given a distinguished flying cross. And then the crew signed up for 10 more. Whoa. And after 10 more that they actually survived, they were given an air medal. And then they came home. But yeah, uh, of course he never talked about it. Oh, no, he never talked about it. No, of course not. Why would you want to talk about that? Yeah, it's just a distinguished flying cross. Who cares? Yeah, it's one step from a Medal of Honor. That's why you... I talk about it all day. I wear it all the time. <laughs> Come on, you know I would. Yeah. Um, he came back, uh, really developed the program at St. Cloud State. Oops, wrong direction. There's the marching man afterwards, Lewis Foote as the uh, drum major. Mm. Um, I've got a video of this. I, um, if there's time, I will show, remind me, I will show you, it's a real to real, it's an 8 millimeter film that I transferred to digital, and it's of his band in black and white. You've got to see it, they're awesome. If you're really good today, if you're really nice to me, I'll show it to you at the end of the presentation, all right? Only if you're really good. Oh yeah, look at that, oh my gosh, the Tron twirlers, we only have one right now, look at that. 1962, there was stability going on. That's what was going on. Of course, in 52, uh, students swam the Mississippi River for the first time. Uh, the last time was in 1977 that a student swam the Mississippi River. Uh, that student in 1977 was legally drunk. And uh, after that, they stopped that tradition, which is really unfortunate. Uh, Harold Kruger uh, was director for 56, and he went to Augustana. 
Then Kent Froep comes in 68. Uh, in 66, back when we had the World's Fair, ha! The band and choir actually went to the World's Fair in New York. That's huge. Oh, look at that. That's outside of Stewart Hall in 1968. Beautiful uniforms. Look at those red and uh, the twirlers, and that's awesome. Uh, that is them playing for a Vikings game, uh, which was huge for them to get into that. And there they are playing for the Vikings game. And here's a funny little picture. So my first year there, I'm looking around with limited budget trying to figure out how to get a podium for the Husky Sports Band. And, <laughs> now there's Ken Froep standing on a beautiful ladder and everything. And everyone tells me, well, we don't have money. You just got to figure it out. And I found this photo. So I started asking around, where is that ladder? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So I finally asked the person that matters. That's the janitor. <laughs> and the janitor says, look at the photo. And he goes, well, yeah, I know where it is. You want it? I said, yeah. So he went and uh, he picked it up. <laughs> now, here's, here's the funny part. <laughs> this ladder, yes, it was used by Ken Froak playing for the Vikings game, St. Cloud State College. This ladder was being used by the janitor to change light bulbs. <laughs> because that marching band program was eliminated in the 70s. Uh, they eliminated it uh, partially, they say, student lack of interest. Money, of course. I don't know. I think it was a combination of that and a few other things. But this ladder is awesome. And we still use it for the Husky Sports Band. And it worked for Kent and Froep, and it works fine for me as well. I love this ladder, yeah. That, it was for changing light bulbs. Kent and Froep played a lot with the marching band, and... 68, big change. The whole band program moves from Stewart Hall to a new performing arts center, brand new performing arts center that got built. Doc Severinsen, which I was playing a couple tracks of, but when you're coming in, comes and solos. <coughs> Dennis Lane replaces Kent Froep as director of bands, etc. cetera. Uh, they eliminate the marching band. Yes, there were some streaking incidents. Yes. <laughs> if any of you were involved, I don't want to know. <laughs> Kent Froep also was instrumental, pardon the pun, in starting the jazz band program. We had no jazz band program, and Kent really loved jazz, so he really built the entire jazz band program. This guy, Dennis Lane, he just retired a few years ago. I was good friends with him. I don't know why, but we were good friends. Uh, had him over to my house for dinner. I found, when he was director of bands in 75, I found one of the tour booklets. And these are all the quotes that he said on the podium. I'm not going to read them to you, but it gives you a sense of his sense of humor. Very dry. <laughs> Very dry sense of humor. Sounds like your nose is in your navel. He's a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a change that happened within the state of Minnesota, right after uh, Dr. Lane had been here for a few years, the state of Minnesota changed our high school graduation requirements. Not a big deal, right? huge deal, almost as big as 1917. They changed the number of credits that high schoolers needed to graduate high school in Minnesota, and they increased the number while decreasing the number of electives. What does that do? It makes it more difficult for high school students to take band, choir, or orchestra. Does that make sense? Yeah, that happened right near eh, two or three years into his work and membership started to go down. So it was a really messy internal struggle. How do we increase membership? How do we do that? And one of their ideas was, let's start back at the marching band. That'll help increase membership. So they hired uh, Richard Hansen, uh, who goes by Rickard Hansen and Richard Hansen and Rick, R-I-K, Rick Hansen. He came in as director of bands and replaced Dennis Lane. Uh, it was a very uncomfortable time in the department. It was a tough transition. 
and he came in in 83. In 84, he restarted the marching band. We had a really good football team back then. There's the new marching band at the bridge dedication. Uh, do you remember rap? Rap music? <laughs> yeah, I don't really understand it either, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, the band wrote their own rap. So if I hear you yelling this at a football game, I'll know where it came from. Um, but the band practiced right on campus. It was very successful. This photo, they are now standing right now on what is the iSelf Engineering Building on campus. What happened was, before that it was the 810 building, which is the bookstore. One year that uh, Dr. Hansen was on sabbatical, they came in and built a building <laughs> right on top of where the marching band practiced. No communication, no coordination, and therefore, no marching band. Yeah. That's 84. Yeah, and then you know, in 87, 88, 89, they had a different director every year. Dr. Hansen wanted to focus on wind ensemble, so they found adjuncts to fill it in. Well, when you have a different director every year, what happens? Not much. Things get better? <laughs> no! No, you had a different director every year, and at the end of the fall 89 season, the entire marching band was eliminated. So that's the second time they've eliminated the marching band, all right? And just like the first time when they did it, they sold everything. They sold off the equipment, the uniforms, gone. Flags, gone. Everything just walked off. The interesting part was the students still wanted to play. Uh, that's Dr. Hansen with the Wind Ensemble in 84. 1990, the first student-sponsored university sports band started but there were no faculty involved, none whatsoever. Uh, so the music, musically it wasn't as strong. They had a lot of interesting uh, problems. This one, article from 1990 that I tracked down, the band earned a technical foul. <laughs> at a fast <coughs> now the article doesn't give full creeds to it. But I tracked down some of the band members who were there. What they say happened was the refs were making bad calls. The band was heckling the refs, which we still do. But the band started playing the song Free Blind Mike. <laughs> and I think they played it very poorly, but the ref turned around. Technical! <laughs> Gave a bench technical on the band. <laughs> I love that though! By the way, if you've never done oral interviews, that's the kind of information you track down when you're doing oral interviews. If somebody mentions this, who mentions that, who mentions that, you connect it, then you find the data and you can actually <coughs> prove it. Uh, it hasn't happened since. Uh, sports band not banding. You had a lot of transition problems with a student-run sports band with no university uh, observation or supervision.